Hi, welcome to Elizabeth Reads. Today I have Tamsin Winter's Jemima Small versus the Universe. I am on chapter 30, so we are more than halfway through. Let's see what the chapter bruises has to tell us. The next day, I got to school just as Lottie and Alina were walking through the gates. Jasper headed to his form class and I waited for Miki on one of the concrete benches, watching the wind blow leaves into little eddies. I noticed Lottie looking over. She said something to Alina, but I couldn't hear because of the wind. Jemima, Lottie called, waving me over. Come here. I slowly got up off the bench and walked over to where they were standing. What's that in your hair? Lottie screwed up her nose. At first, I thought she was attempting a joke. When we first started in year seven, she asked what was on my face and then said, oh, nothing. Sorry, you're just ugly. I didn't laugh, so she said, it was just a joke, Jemima. If they asked Lottie for the definition of joke at the Brainiac Selection Day, she'd be in serious trouble. There's something in your hair, something pink, look. Lottie pulled a strand of my hair from the back and I got a glimpse of electric pink. The hair chalk, I'd forgotten to wash it out. Oh, it's hair chalk, I said, I got it with a magazine. It's nice, Alina said, tugging on Lottie's arm, let's go. But Lottie didn't move, it is nice, she said. But this look flashed in her eyes. I'd seen it loads of times before. She grabbed my hair again. When I first thought it, I thought you might be turning into a pig. She snorted, a big fat pig. I pulled my hair out of her hand and stepped back. And then I noticed Brandon was walking right towards us. Don't worry, Jemima, Lottie laughed. Looks aren't everything. Lottie, Alina stuttered as Brandon's face appeared in between theirs. He coughed and stood there for a moment arms folded, staring at them. He'd had his hair shaved at the sides. Lottie gulped. Everyone at school knew Brandon Taylor. He was someone you avoided at all costs. He got suspended last year for sellotaping two year eights together. I don't like what I just saw, Brandon said to Lottie. It didn't look very nice. He leaned his face towards hers. You better leave my friend Jemima alone. Sorry, Lottie spluttered at approximately the speed of light. Sorry, Jemima, I didn't mean it. She grabbed Alina's arm and scuttled away like a dung beetle, only with honey blonde hair, and not able to pull over a thousand times her body weight. Thanks, Brandon, I said. Brandon shrugged. Fat club coat, isn't it? And then he disappeared into the crowd. It took Lottie a few days to even look at me after that. She didn't say anything in form when Mr. Nelson reminded us that the camping trip was in less than three weeks, like anyone could forget that impending doom. But that wasn't the only thing that changed. On Friday, the day before we broke up for half term, I passed Dylan Taylor in the corridor on the way to Gina's class, and it was the first time, since approximately year two, that he didn't say anything to me. Having Brandon as a friend was an unexpected perk of Fat Club. A bit like Percy Spencer developing radar transmitters during World War II and accidentally inventing the microwave. On Friday, we were doing Gina's class in one of the cookery classrooms for a change. And when I got there, Heidi, Harry, Nate, and Maya were already waiting outside. I don't get how we're supposed to lose weight if she keeps feeding us, Maya said. Some boys walked past and she squeezed against the wall like she was trying to disappear into it. Miss Newton said we're doing mixed sports after half term. Maya rested her head on the wall. Maybe I can get my mom to write a note. P.E.'s the worst, Harry said. Actually, getting changed for P.E. is the worst. We all nodded. There were only two cubicles in the girls' changing rooms, so anytime we had P.E., I raced to get in the changing rooms first. The teachers stay in the office while you get changed, so anyone can say anything to you. But at least there were cubicles in the girls. Miki said there were none in the boys. They call me tiny, Harry said, half laughing. That's a joke. Yeah, but it's not funny, Harry, Heidi said. I keep telling him to go to Mrs. Savage about it. Show them. Harry shook his head. Just show them, Harry. It's not a big deal, Harry said. Just banter. Heidi stared at him. He sighed and took off his blazer. It looks worse than it is. He undid a few of his shirt buttons and pulled it down over his shoulder. The top part of his arm was covered in bruises. <gasps> oh, no, I blurted out. Sorry, Harry. It just looks bad. Some of the bruises were brand new, but some were old and had gone kind of yellowy. It's called bilirubin. It's what's left over after your body has collected all the iron from the bruise. Who knows how many had disappeared completely. Whoa, Robert, who hit you? Brandon said, coming around the corner. It's nothing, Harry said, just this thing my mates do.
Brandon looked confused. I'd crush them with one punch, mate. Yeah, mates don't do that, Harry. That's what I've been saying, Heidi said. Friends don't give you bruises. You've got to tell Mrs. Savage or Miss Fraser. We have to go camping with them after half term. It's not that bad, Heidi. They just do it as a joke. Harry lifted his arm and pulled the skin to get a better look. Harry, my friends would never do that, I said. Miki sticks up for me. I didn't mention the fart machine. Mrs. Savage could have installed listening devices around the school. She already had CCTV up in some places, apparently. And what's funny about punching someone? Oh my, oh. Harry's cheeks went red. It doesn't hurt that much. Oh my goodness, Harry, what happened? Gina put down some bags she was carrying and took Harry's arm. Harry quickly pulled his shirt back up. Harry, what happened? Gina asked again, looking around at us all. We looked at each other, but no one said anything. This isn't a one-off. Who's been doing this to you? I guess Gina noticed the Billy Rubin too. She unlocked the classroom door and said, come inside, Harry. We waited in the corridor for about 10 minutes while Gina and Harry sat talking in the classroom. Apart from Heidi, no one else really said anything. And they've been getting him to buy them stuff from the canteen at break. I'm so worried about the camping trip, Heidi said. They'll probably set his tent on fire or something as a joke. She moved over to the classroom door and looked through the window. Poor Harry, what do you think Gina's saying? Brandon squashed his face up next to hers, pressing his nose against the glass, probably offering to make him a cauliflower smoothie. Gina looked over and Brandon gave her a thumbs up through the window. She tilted her head and pretended to be mad for about a quarter of a second and then turned her smile up to the maximum. I think it's physically impossible for Gina to be mad at anyone. Like her body is so dense in nutrients, she doesn't have the space for it. Sorry, everyone. Thank you for waiting so patiently. Come on in. Brandon, grab those shopping bags, would you? We filed into the classroom. Heidi went straight over to Harry while Gina stood at the front saying, so today's class is all about superfoods, the superheroes of food. I tried not to groan too loud. You're going to be making some super simple, super delicious, super healthy recipes. She clapped her hands each time she said super. It kind of felt like brainwashing. Get into pairs and I'll bring you an iPad so you can watch your recipe on YouTube. And we get to taste all of them at the end. I walked with Maya to a corner kitchen as Gina handed us an iPad and a box of ingredients. Inside was a recipe card saying courgette noodles with avocado pesto. This is the fun bit, Gina said, and typed the recipe into YouTube. A woman wearing thick black eyeliner with perfect flicks was paused on the screen. There, Gina said, you're ready to go. Maya tapped the iPad and the video came to life. The cook was American and approximately 300% more enthusiastic than Gina, which I didn't think was physically possible. She said, mmm, and let's do this a lot. It's not what cooking's like in my family. Dad shouts up the stairs for us to come and help, then he spends ages saying the recipe makes no sense and then burns himself, then yells, why hasn't anybody set the table? And usually it ends with a smoke alarm going off. No one says, mmm, at any point, especially not when we're eating it. Once everyone had finished cooking, we sat down at the big table in the center of the classroom. There were napkins, a jug of water, some salad, sourdough bread Gina had made at home apparently, although it looked professional to me, so she could have been lying. She placed a vase of yellow roses in the middle and it was sort of really nice. For once, I didn't care about eating in front of people at school. Brandon and Nate handed out their wholemeal flatbreads and pots of hummus while Gina talked enthusiastically about the incredible qualities of chickpeas like they were real superheroes. Heidi dished out the rice she and Harry had made out of a cauliflower while Harry sat gazing out of the window. Gina said everything tasted amazing and told us about the nutritional content of courgettes. It wasn't as boring as it sounds because they contain potassium, which is one of my favorite chemical elements. It's the one that burns with a lilac flame and makes a huge tower of foam if you mix it with hydrogen peroxide. Nana only let me do that experiment with her hair bleach once, but it was pretty good. I listened to Gina talking about cauliflower and tried not to yawn. She knew so much about food she could probably audition for Brainiacs if she wasn't already too old. She looked about the same age as my dad, but maybe she wasn't that old. She could have aged prematurely because she smiled so much. When the bell went, Gina said, Jemima, would you mind staying behind for a sec? I thought I was in trouble to begin with, but she handed me a small parcel wrapped in green paper. I heard it's your birthday on Sunday, so here's a little gift from me. 
Mm, thanks. Who told you it was my birthday? Gina smiled practically 100%. Oh, just a little birdie. I guess she must have accessed my school record. I wasn't totally sure that was allowed. It's also to wish you luck at the Brainiac Selection Day. What with half term, I won't see you before then. I expect you're glad to be getting a break from my class. But listen, she perched on the edge of the table. There'll be a lot of other kids at the competition. Maybe you'll have some eyes on you, but remember, you've earned your place just like they have, maybe even with a higher score. So hold your head up, you hear me? Thanks, Gina, I said, and I felt her words swelling up inside me like my heart was listening. On the way out, I stopped and turned round. I do like your classes, by the way. I felt kind of stupid in case she thought I only said it because of the present, but I hoped she knew I wouldn't do that, and definitely not before I'd opened it. What did you get? Lottie whispered to me that afternoon in mass as Mrs. Lee handed out our test papers from last lesson. I could see 96% written on Lottie's paper in green ink and Mrs. Lee's swirly writing saying, excellent. I wasn't afraid of Lottie, not in the normal sense. I just got this prickly feeling in my chest anytime she spoke to me, like being stung by a jellyfish. They have these special cells in their tentacles containing venom that can go through your skin in a matter of milliseconds. Lottie seemed to have them on her tongue. I covered my test paper with my elbow and said 90. I stupidly thought it might make her leave me alone. Lottie smiled so hard, her face almost cracked open. She picked up her test and fanned herself. I got 96. Maybe you should have revised instead of, she waited until Mrs. Lee was on the other side of the classroom, eating so much. Lottie turned back to face the front. I moved my elbow off my test paper and looked again what Mrs. Lee had written. 100%, see me for some higher papers. Why didn't you tell her your real score, Aaron whispered. She's so annoying. I shrugged and looked back at Lottie. She's smiling at herself in the mirror on her pencil case. Aaron was right. Even the back of Lottie's head was annoying. Mrs. Lee tapped the screen and a series of equations with unknown quantities appeared. Now, before we start, I want to say a special well done to Eric and Jemima, both of whom scored 100% on the test. My cheeks flushed as everybody started clapping. Lottie whipped her head round and glared at me. I felt that stinging feeling in my chest and then noticed Afsal and Jazz smiling at me from the other side of the classroom. Erin showed me the 64% written on her paper and whispered, I wish I was like you. And something happened in my stomach, like someone had ignited a tiny flame. I leaned forward. Don't worry, Lottie. Brains aren't everything. And I accidentally trod on her foot on the way up to solve the first equation. That is the end of chapter 30. Subscribe and you will find out when chapter 31 comes up. Bye-bye.